Without further ado, I'm your uh, chair for tonight, Hanna Kawas, my name. And I'd like to welcome all of you here and uh, recognize that this event takes place on unceded Coast Salish territories of our indigenous sisters and brothers. And we are here with the blessing of their eagle feather. It, 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 was, it was given to us by uh, the elders uh, of the downtown Eastside Women's Center. Uh, I'll, I'll tell you the story first. The AFN, the Assembly of First Nation, sent a delegation, one of the largest, to Israel in 2006. So our native sisters and brothers were upset, and they invited us to their to the um, downtown East Side Women's Center to talk about it and how, you know, the, we feel about the trip to Israel. And I spoke there, and at the end they gave us this feather, eagle feather, and I consider it as our visa and passport <laughs> to this land. So thank you, our indigenous brother and sister. Without further ado, I'd like to introduce Amel Ghazal uh, from the Center for Cooperative, Co Comparative Muslim Studies. She is going to welcome us to uh, the SFU uh, uh, new campus. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Hanna, for the introduction or, and for bringing the feather here. Uh, this is a reminder that um, our struggle for Palestine is a global struggle against settler colonialism. And I want to thank you and thank uh, my colleague, uh, Samir Gandash, who's, who's not here, I think, for all the efforts you've been doing to bring us here together. And uh, it's all, our pleasure to have you here today. I welcome you all on behalf of my colleagues at the Institute for the Humanities, uh, the Center for Comparative uh, Muslim Studies, and the School for Inter International Studies, all at SFU, and on behalf of my colleagues at the Canada-Palestine Association and Independent Jewish Voices Canada. They've all sponsored this event. We're honored to have Dr. Baroud here and to hear his take on the modern history of Palestine through the various accounts he has gathered and analyzed. My upbringing in Lebanon was largely defined by my friendship and interaction with Palestinian refugees. I'm glad to know that refugees' accounts feature prominently uh, in his book. Uh, a most suitable person to introduce Dr. Ramzi Baroud and his work is Marion Kawas, a regular contributor to the Palestine Chronicle, edited by Dr. Baroud. Marion, please. Thank you. Thank you, Amal. Um, first of all, I, I'm uh, like to say how great it is to see everybody here tonight. We're really happy to, to see such a good turnout. And I would like to just take a few minutes to introduce our guest speaker to you. Uh, rather than read you a list of all his academic accomplishments, which he does have, I would rather instead talk about his contributions as an activist and as a writer. I first became acquainted with his writing with his first book, Searching Janine, in 2002, and have followed his work since then. As a contributor myself to the Palestine Chronicle website, which Ramsey edits, I have always appreciated the dedication that both the Chronicle and Ramsey himself have in promoting and guaranteeing space for grassroots voices and Palestinian voices. He is also one of the most forthright writers about what constitutes real solidarity with the Palestinian people. This is what he wrote over a year ago on that subject. Any solidarity that deviates from the current aspirations of Palestinians, as articulated by their fighting women and men, by their prisoners on hunger strikes, by their students fighting for the right to education, 
by these resilient but often neglected voices, this is not true solidarity. And now he has launched his latest book, The Last Earth, A Palestinian Story, which he has brought with him tonight. Just before I turn the mic over to him, I want to read a few sentences from an article he wrote two months ago in December 2017. He was talking about the first intifada, the first Palestinian intifada in December 1987, and its impact on the young Palestinian boys in his refugee camp in Gaza, where he grew up. He was one of those boys, and here is what he wrote in that article. My name is Ramsey, and I am the son of Mohammed, a freedom fighter from the Nusirat refugee camp, and the grandson of a peasant who died of a broken heart and was buried beside the grave of my brother, a little boy who died because there was no medicine in the refugee camp's UN clinic. My mother is Zarefa, a refugee who could not spell her name, whose illiteracy was compensated by a heart overflowing with love for her children, a woman who had the patience of a prophet. I am a free boy. In fact, I am a free man. Please join me in welcoming Ramsey Garou. Thank you so very much for this lovely introduction, um, for all of you for being here, um, for honoring the characters in my book and, and the people that I try to my best uh, ability to represent, or at least to convey their voices to the world. Um, I thank the sponsors of this event. Um, it, uh, it really means a lot um, that, that people still care enough that there is a Palestinian narrative and it needs to be articulated and told and retold. Um, I also realize that Marion, I think, might have lost her glasses here, so I need to give it to her. <laughs> so the question really that, that started this whole thing was a very simple question. What if Palestinians are allowed to speak for themselves? Now, it, it, it's, it's seemingly a simple question, but in reality, it's quite convoluted. Because in many platforms, everywhere, really, in the world, there's always someone else who speaks for Palestinians, speaks on behalf of Palestinians. Um, to the point that we, over the course of the years, kind of almost turned into like outsiders to our own narrative. The narrative is being conveyed by someone else, maybe pro-Palestinian, not necessarily always anti-Palestinian, um, but we are almost kind of timid and afraid to speak for ourselves, and we don't want to m mess up, we don't know what we are saying. You know, Mainstream media and Western media expect certain articulation and certain refined language, and those peasants and the refugees and, you know, they can't really possibly convey a message that is clear enough, strong enough, resounding enough that actually makes a difference. As a result, we've decided to kind of disregard him altogether. But the fact is, Palestine is not Mahmoud Abbas and the Palestinian Authority. Palestine is not what the media decides to reduce Palestine to. Palestine is not a cliche. It's not redundant discourse of a peace process and painful compromises and land for peace formula and all of this. Palestine is made of millions of Palestinians in Palestine, outside Palestine, in the Shatat, in the diaspora, who are indeed the reason of why we are still talking about Palestine. It is the fact that they have resisted all of those years, and despite of the tremendous odds, 
they still managed to articulate a sense of identity, a sense of nationhood that made them who they are. So why are we not representing Palestinians the way we should? The Palestinian ended up being either a terrorist or a victim. If you sympathize with Palestinians, then you perceive Palestinians as a victim. If you don't sympathize, then they are terrorists. They don't exist in, in anywhere else in that equation except in these two extremes. But they are not necessarily victims, and they are definitely not terrorists. And this is how I approached it. I did my PhD on the subject of people's history at the University of Exeter. And all my books, really, starting with Search in Janine, the Second Palestinian Intifada, A History of a People's Struggle, my father's work was a freedom fighter, and so on. I tried to constantly discover these voices, that they are important, significant, central to the Palestinian narrative, yet the most marginalized. They are sound bites. They are they perceived to be unimportant. And this is what I came up with, this book. Just before he died, Muhammad Abdul Ghani Al Lubani had transferred the deed of his Yarmouk home to his son's name and also left him with another small plot of land in Al Mjadil, the original village in Palestine from which he was expelled before walking to Jobar, the old man, proud man, who paved roads in Nazareth and sco scooped cow dung in Syria, also left his family with his most prized possession, a large, old, rusting key that had opened the door to his cherished Palestinian home. The house no longer exists. But the key was kept in the family home in Yarmouk as a testament to their right of return. And now, the Yarmouk home no longer exists. The legacy of that original refugee who once walked to Jobar with his whole family in one straight line is still fully observed by his grandchildren, all of them. And Khalid Jamal Abdul Ghani Al Lubani, also known as Marco, is still walking to his next resting place in one straight line. The Palestinian narrative seems to be distorted. The Palestinian narrative as a collective account of the Palestinian people, of their history, the articulation of their present, the aspirations of their future, is almost missing from the picture. The Palestinian political discourse is splendid, splintered, divided between factions, political parties, ideologies, and vastly separate, dem separate demands and expectations. But how are we to reclaim it? How do we decide that this is, that the language that the Palestinian Authority is using, what Palestinian officials are using, what factions, competing factions are using, is not necessarily the language of the Palestinian people? How do we step up and liberate the Palestinian narrative, not just from the Zionist narrative that is dominant and domineering, but also from the Palestinian, the divided and splintered Palestinian discourse. And that is when the intellectual must step, step in. There is no way around it. We can't sit and wait for eternity, calling for unity, calling for Mahmoud Abbas to change his ways, calling for this, calling for that. The intellectual must step in. Antonio Gramsci, one of really my favorite socialists of all times, and my favorite in the sense that this is a man who did not, as we say, did not just talk the talk, he also walked the walk. This is a man who died in prison uh, 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 in Italy during the fascist era because of his beliefs. 
And he said, the problem is the public often feels but doesn't always understand because they are kept in the dark and they are neglected and oppressed and so forth. The intellectual, however, often understand but doesn't always feel. So the challenge is, how do we raise the kind of public consciousness where the public can understand and feel? He also said that, that every man and woman is also an intellectual, even though they might not serve the role of intellectuals in public places. So everyone has the potential of understanding the world around him, his relationships with the world, and, and understand the role that he could play to make the world a better place. Everyone can be part of that dialectic. And this is why I say that the intellectual must step up and tell the story of Palestine as essentially the story of the Palestinian people. And that story is not defined by Israel. And this is really important. For a long time, Palestinians have been telling their story in negations, as in, we are constantly on the defensive. The Zionists started way before we even arrived to the scene, whether in the West or elsewhere. The Zionists defined the discourse. The Zionists managed to articulate a fabricated version of history, as you all, many of you already know. And then the Palestinians come in, and we are caught in this dilemma. We can't provide an authentic, original, uh, 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 native version of our history. So we tell history in negation. We are not terrorists. We are not all Hamas, and so forth and so on. This whole idea that we are not what you think we are, because the mainstream media has already brainwashed you to think that we are something else. In the process of doing so, we forgot to tell who we actually are. Ahmed and thousands more stared at each tired soul as they walked past, looking for familiar faces or recognizable gestures as they stood near the border to ascertain who remained alive of his family, friends, and acquaintances. When he was finally able to wrap his arms around his mother and all of his siblings, gratitude rushed through him, especially on learning that his sister Maliha, who was almost killed trying to save the gluttonous cow, was alive and well. Not everyone was that lucky, of course. So many familiar faces were assigned a place in memory as their journey in this life would, in, would end in Al Fallujah and not in Gaza's refugee camps. Ahmed lost many people dear to him, including his uncle and his family from his mother's side and a teenage Egyptian soldier he had befriended in the early days of the siege. The two friends would talk every night into the early hours of the morning about poetry and an ideal world where all the fallahin, the peasants of the world, were united against imperialism, Zionism, and the feudalistic families that spoke of revolutions but chose to escape before the battle even commenced. The missing faces would haunt Ahmed in the back of his mind, yet many fallahin thought that perhaps there was some mercy in not coming back at all. I was talking to um, Hannah earlier today, and he mentioned something interesting about the concept of unity. We are co constantly calling, Palestinians must be united. There has to be unity. And he raised an important point. Unity around what? It's not unity that truly matters, is the principles around which we are united. Why do we want to unite with a group of people who are using Palestinians, subjugating Palestinians, 
collecting handouts on behalf of Palestinians, living with this fake sense of prestige and pseudo-sovereignty in the name of Palestine. That's not the kind of unity that we actually want. The Palestinian people are united because of their sense of nationhood, their sense of identity, belonging to an ideal shared history, a set of values that makes them unique and distinct. And what truly allowed Palestinians to maintain that identity? And I'm going to give you a few seconds to think about it. Not hummus, not falafel, no. <laughs> not belly dancing, no. It's resistance. It's their resistance. Resistance in an actual, effective, but also at a cultural level. The fact that for 70 years, they have refused to submit is what makes them who they are as a nation. That is the key and the secret to the modern Palestinian identity. Yes, we are ancient people, and we are very complex and convoluted, and, and there is so much about us that cannot be reduced to a book or 10 or 100, but that, that element, that of our resistance, that what makes us truly united, despite of all the odds and all the barriers and all the apartheid walls and all the settlements and all the checkpoints and all the divisions that exist amongst us, is the fact that we still maintain our resistance. And that's what makes us who we are. Resistance is man and woman recreating himself or herself. It's a process of recreation. That's, that's what Jean-Paul Sartre said in his introduction to Wretched of the Earth by Franz Fanon. It's a process of recreating oneself. Resistance is the idea this is why it, it really just confuses me when people start arguing, you know, are you with violent resistance or nonviolent? Resistance is not a strategy per se. This is to be left to the Palestinians to be determined by the situation and the time and the place in which that resistance takes place. But the idea of resistance is not negotiable. Hiba. I tried my hardest to shield you from all harm. You saw me in my heyday as a fighter, in my military fatigues, but also as a broken man who worked under the burning sun, who worked under the burning sun as a manual laborer. My pocket hid the secret of a fake name on a forged identity card. All the while, I was fighting for you. And I really thought we could win. I long fantasized about our final trip to Palestine once it would be liberated. I imagined you wearing the thobe I brought you from Burj al Barajna, embroidered with the colors of the flag. I imagined Ahmed as a fighter too, wearing a khaki outfit adorned with a black and white kofiya, in that fantasy. I was always old, but strong enough to remember everything clearly. I would guide you through our village in Wadi Shalalha in Dir al Saba. This is where your grandfather Aish fell in love with your grandmother Hamda, I would say. And he would smile and insist that I tell you the story all over again. And you needed to know every detail, from the color of the sky to the flowers that bloomed. He was a poor man. He was a poor man too, a Bedouin, like me. And like me, he was short, dark, and wrinkled. But unlike me, he had little patience. His life was always hard, and when he was forced out of his village, And when he was forced out of his village, that small piece of land we call Atur al Abyad, he lost his mind. He lost everything. The elitist interpretation of Palestine has completely failed. And there is absolutely no room at recreating it. The entire discourse, anyway, was an American discourse. The US wanted to lead the peace process, not to bring peace and justice for the Palestinian people, but because they wanted to create this permanent relevance 
in the Middle East. They are the leaders of the Middle East. They are the bullies of the Middle East. You can't, you can't get involved in the Middle East without going through the American gate. Remember, the whole peace process thing happened after the Gulf War. It was, what, 1990, 1991, and the Madrid negotiations started. So the US wanted to have complete hegemony over the Middle East, militarily, but politically as well. And many Palestinians, sadly, played along. So when Donald Trump decides to move the embassy from uh, Tel Aviv to Jerusalem, what he's essentially saying that we are divesting from this. For his own reasons, Palestinians are unimportant to him. They're not a powerful lobby that is you know, raising hell in Washington, DC. They don't have the kind of influence that uh, the other side has, and it's no, no interest to him to maintain the charade. This is why the Palestinian Authority right now is desperate. They are desperate because they feel that they have been orphaned by this. Wait a minute, we've created this whole beautiful piece of work called the peace process. <laughs> we are called ministers and we are driving around in these limousines and red carpets and flags and stamps and all of this. Sure, Palestinians are losing their land every day and losing their lives every day, but this is negligible, that's not the issue. And you can't come and tell us that after all of these years, we trusted you, United States. We put our faith in you. And now you decide that you are turning your back on us. So it's like almost like an elitist feud between the Palestinian Authority and Israel and the United States. None of this is of any relevance to the Palestinians. Our struggle will continue, regardless of what the US does or does not do. Because we were not counting on the United States. We were not. It was not part of our calculation as a people. We knew who our any enemy were and still are. Palestinians, as I said earlier, are neither terrorists nor perpetual victims. They should neither aspire hatred nor pity. Their story, identity, and resistance are three-dimensional, complex, tragic, inspiring, filled with contradictions, consistencies, despairs, and hope. And it is that strength in the face of numerous odds that make them relevant and make their story relevant, despite of every attempt by commercial, corporate, mainstream media to marginalize them. By the time the flames were extinguished in that cruel November, hundreds had perished in the war on Gaza with its beguiling name that echoed in mainstream media propaganda. While Gaza's graveyards expanded in various directions as people scrambled to bury their dead, to Joe's astonishment, Gazans were still grateful that the number of casualties was not as high as that of the previous war. They all kneeled down and prayed for their martyrs before burying them and hanging up photos of men and women across Gaza streets. It was, a bid, it was a bid to keep their smiling faces alive just a little bit longer. Before the elements beckoned the evanescent visual poems back to ashes. And the faces of inculpable dead children were immortalized in graffiti tributes atop somber gray walls throughout the refugee camps reminding all who saw them how life can betray you. The following morning, they began crushing the destroyed concrete remnants of collapsed buildings, turning the gravel and grit into bricks, trying to rebuild the homes, schools, and clinics that were demolished. The task was great if not impossible, because Gaza was still recuperating and under reconstruction after thousands of homes were destroyed in the earlier war a few years ago, deemed Operation Cast led by the Israelis. The destruction was happening at a much faster rate than the reconstruction, yet somehow Gazans ignored this and kept on fighting, weary and angry, but steadfast 
as ever. Gazans are a unique people, unmatched in their kindness and spirit of rebellion. At least that is how they struck Joe Catron when he first arrived in the Strip in the early months of 2011. He came to stay for a couple of days that somehow turned into a few years. How do we reverse this process? <coughs> this process, this discourse that has aimed for such a long time to obliterate the Palestinian people from their own discourse. I don't know if you are following the news, but there is this uh, a new piece of news that came out that there's secret talks between the Palestinian Authority and Israel under Saudi auspices. Have you heard of that? This whole idea that Palestine is a commodity can be traded. Someone is trying to kiss up to Washington, we have to go through Tel Aviv, you throw the Palestinians under the bus. Someone's trying to um, purify his name, defend accused, against accusation. Whatever, Palestinians are just sitting there. You just grab them off the shelf. You sell them, you throw them away, you bring them back. And this is how we have been caught in this, in this dominant hegemonic discourse that has been controlled by the, the United States, uh, corrupt Arab regimes, and sadly, our own so-called leadership. The Palestinians have, not only they need to be the conveyors of their own narratives, but the interpreters of their own narrative. Um, as, a, as Palestinians being the, 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 the talking Palestinian, you know, these conferences that happens in the name of Palestine, and sometimes you don't find a single Palestinian speaking, all of this that is, you know, there was this, uh, and there's no need to name names here, but there's this conference that happens once in a while in Brussels and sometimes in London and sometimes elsewhere, and in which all the people in the panels are purposely not Palestinians, and Palestinians come and then they just talk about their misery and they are witnesses, and, and these judges, these experts in international law, whatever, then they decide that Israel is an apartheid state or Israel is this and Israel. And it's like, thank you so much for the solidarity, but we are, capable of articulating a very sophisticated discourse as a people. We can't just be the victim, just sitting there and trying to display our nakedness and our victimhood and imploring you and appealing to you and asking you to look at us with a little bit of mercy and to recognize that maybe ultimately perhaps we are human beings. We can't do that anymore. We have to reclaim our narrative. We have to be the spokespeople for our own people. We can't be on the sideline anymore. We can't be cheerleaders anymore. History from below. Maybe some of you are already familiar with this concept. I don't know if you read uh, Howard Zinn's The uh, uh, People's History of the United States. There are various books on people's history, is this notion that no, history is not made by great men. You know, the great man theory, the idea that only great men, and usually actually men, are the ones who shape history. The multitudes, the masses, the people are just there to be manipulated, to be controlled, to be oppressed, but they are not a factor in influencing outcomes of history. History, in fact, is not shaped by great men. History is shaped as a result of a competition, a dialectics, if you will, between various influential and powerful groups on one hand and large popular movements on the other. When we come and say BDS, what we actually say BDS is essentially a large popular movement. And we are trying to compete against this influential, powerful, but usually small groups. We know that we are going to win, because in the long run, the people always do. History is not told, or should not be told, as the story of the rich and powerful. This is why you have business pages in newspapers, and rarely you have labor pages. I'm not sure, maybe, maybe Canada is more progressive than we have in this. No, it's as bad, yes. 
despite the fact that the business class does not even represent really when we say 1% is an exaggeration, yet the 99% are completely, you know, they are the ones looking for jobs, they are the ones who's looking for validations, working on their CVs, trying to appeal to that business class, but the business class controls everything. How about the other 99%? How do they fit in our understanding of history? And for that history to be relevant, it has to be told and retold through the eyes, the hopes, the pains and of the nameless multitudes who toil, struggle, and often pay the price of war. The first Palestinian intifada in 1987 was an excellent example of when Palestinians rose as one nation and united for six, seven years and made a huge difference. And this is really important that we understand. You hear quite often that people call for um, a third intifada. And... But an intifada is not, it's not a liberation movement, per se. Intifadas don't liberate land. Intifadas is a collective cry and reassertion of the self by the people. Is a creation of the self and the recreation of the identity. Is the emphasis that this is who we are, this is what we belong, and the demolishing of all the walls. That's what the Intifada is essentially is. And this is why the first Palestinian Intifada in 1987 was perhaps one of the most important collective acts by the Palestinian people ever. Israeli snipers stood motionless in awe of the crowds whose masses extended from the army tents to the sea. It was the furthest horizon the soldiers on the watchtower could view, even if they wanted to fire. There were not enough bullets to take out everyone, young and old, weak and strong. They all walked in unison, marching in front Women led the way as icons of female power, while children carried flags that they had designed with crayon. The soldiers hid in the, tower, in the towers and trenches, not firing a single bullet. The refugees of the camp who had been trapped for weeks came out of their homes in disbelief when the masses started arriving in Borej. Thousands hugged random thousands in a scene of solidarity never witnessed before in the history of the two camps. As the Nusayrat refugees celebrated their victory upon their return, Umm Marwan felt the tug of two arms embracing her from behind, folding gently upon her neck and chest. Mother, said a voice, that had grown hoarse from incessant chanting. It cradled her every being. The Zionist narrative is a fabricated narrative. And this is not an exaggeration. If you wish, you could actually Google it right now, if you have phones. There was a document. I can never remember it, so I have to write it down. It's GL-18-17028. You know what this document is all about? After the refugees, the Palestinian refugees, were expelled out of Palestine in 1947-48, there was still a lot of global awareness that this is a crisis, nearly a million people being pushed across borders all around the Middle East. There was still the idea of they need to go back, the idea that they have to be sent back to their homes, they have to rebuild their villages. And the discussion was real at the time. And Israel was desperate. They're trying to combat the, 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 the pressure that they are feeling by various countries in the media and so forth. So David Ben-Gurion, the founder of modern Israel, he said, it's just not enough that we are preventing these refugees from coming back. We need to come up with a narrative. You can think of this as like one of the early foundations of the Zionist narratives. We need a story, a talking point that we can tell the media and everyone else of why the refugees left and why they can't come back. So he asked a group of Zionist intellectuals at the time. Now this document is the outcome of that discussion. They, he chose purposely that particular document because he felt it is the most plausible 
amongst all the submissions that he received. Haaretz, the Israeli newspaper Haaretz, uncovered this document a few years ago, and they published it. And in it, the refugees apparently left on their own devices because the Arabs asked them to leave. And because the Arabs asked them to leave, they did so because they wanted to clear that area in order for the Arab armies to come and destroy um, the Jewish population and to create another Holocaust. That was the story, and they went with it. And that continued to be the basis of how they explain why Palestinian refugees were expelled from, from their land in 1947-48. Now, you think this is ridiculous. As, as ridiculous as it is, uh, that now they are saying Muhammad Tamimi, the cousin of Ahid Tamimi, who was shot in the head and lost part of his skull, and now he was rearrested again. They are saying that actually the reason that this happened, he fell off his bike. I actually heard this one time I was in a debate with this Zionist guy at the Uni University of Washington many years ago, and he made a claim. And, and, and this is why I tell you it's ridiculous. It sounds ridiculous to some of us, but it's not ridiculous in, in, in a sense. And I will explain why. He said, no, 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 those people you are talking about, they were actually killed by Palestinians to blame the Jews for this. And I was like, you can't be serious. We have Palestinian gunmen in our protests killing Palestinians in order for them to say that the Israeli Jews have killed them. I mean, that kind of, I mean do you really believe that yourself? But the reason that they say these ridiculous things is that their narrative is the only one that is validated in the media. No matter how ridiculous it may seem to you, when it's the only voice that is being heard, it is the only story that is going to be believed. Because our story, no matter how authentic and real and true and truthful, is not actually there. We are being completely blocked out of the media. Ridiculous to you and me, maybe, but in the greater scheme of things, is not entirely ridiculous. I remember when I did my first book, Search in Janine, I was desperate in trying to create an original narrative that is independent from all the official statements and the press releases and the independent investigations by Amnesty International and all this. I thought, OK, if I bring a group of Palestinians who lived in Jenin, I don't care whether they are Fatah or Hamas or Islamic Jihad or what their political or ideological affiliations is of no concern to me whatsoever. And I asked them to tell me what happened in Jenin in April 2012 and try to somehow connect these narratives, create an overlap, so that there is a, a degree of consistency in the way that the story is being told, without judgment, without intervention on my part. Then I have an authentic Palestinian story of what actually happened in Jenin. The media completely ignored that, entirely and completely. I had, I interviewed over 100 uh, survivor of Janine, out of whom about 50 stories were selected for the book. No mainstream media would touch this. What was being conveyed to the media, that Palestinians have lied about Janine. And the whole thing about Janine was, was uh, manufactured, and in fact, ultimately, is, it was anti-Semitic. To the point that once I managed to get in some um, uh, America, I think it was NPR or and then I was asked, like, how, how do you feel that after all these years that you continue to convey what turned out to be a lie regarding what happened in Janine? And I said, why do you say it's a lie? He said, well, there was no massacre. Well, hundreds of people were killed and wounded. The entire camp was destroyed. Yes, but Palestinians said that over 500 people were killed. And um, so I said, so how do you define a massacre? How many Palestinians would have to be killed in order for this to be called a massacre? Because in the case in the US when a, you know, a school boy goes and kills his peers in, in a classroom, two or three people are killed, it's a massacre. Why Palestinians have to die in such large numbers for us to maybe, perhaps, we bestow upon them the honor of using the word massacre? Why is our blood so cheap to that extent? 
we must expel the Arabs and take their places, is what Ben Gurion has said in a letter to his son. By expelling the Arabs, he wasn't just talking and, and, about the removal of the Palestinian population out of Palestine. There was something else in mind. The process of expelling the Arabs, displacing the Arabs, is happening at every other level, at a cultural level, at a political level. I don't know if you also heard of the, the couscous controversy. Yes? And you, you kind of think about this, like Virgin Atlantic is under a lot of pressure for putting on the menu, for those of you who didn't hear of this, putting on the menu an item that says, Palestinian-inspired couscous salad, because the Zionists were up in arms. No, this is completely unacceptable. Somehow, it became a political controversy, and ultimately, Virgin Atlantic removed the item from the menu. But what is it that bothers the Zionists, exactly? We're not talking about resistance here. We're not talking about, it's not politics. It's not about Jerusalem. It's not about settlements. It's couscous, <laughs> right? But the, 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 the way they see it, and the way they always see it, is the very existence of any re relevance that would validate the Palestinian people and their culture of any kind is not to be allowed. They have to be completely erased. The same way that they are now erasing the names of Arab, Arabic named streets in Palestine, and erasing the cultural identity of Palestine per, per law, per Knesset diktats, and they are not allowing Palestinians to remember and to commemorate their tragedies and their Nakbas. It's part of the same thing. It's not just about settlements. It's not just about land grab. It's not just about checkpoints. It's about removing the idea that there is a nation called the Palestinian people. Because we are an invented people according to their narrative, which is now being touted by many American politicians in the right as well. So we have to understand that this is not just an issue of politics. And it's not about finding solutions. One state or two states. Ramzi, you answer over there. Yeah, no. It's not that. And I hate it when people reduce the, 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 the issue into politicking and, and political discourse as if Benjamin Netanyahu is just eager to find that magical solution. And that solution will be the solution. The solution to apartheid is ending apartheid. It doesn't need to be a political debate. A solution to injustice is removing injustice, the checkpoints and the settlements, and allowing people to be themselves and not to feel fought over their food and their kofiyas and their flags and, and their very right to be who they are as a nation. The Palestinian identity is so very important and we need to put more emphasis on that. Sarah's parents were determined, before I read this, um, how are we doing on time? Are we all right? Um, Sarah's parents were determined that she would grow up to defy the norm, that norm by recognizing herself as a Palestinian, Arab, Christian from Beit Jala. But they could not protect her entirely. Sarah's understanding of herself came into question one day when her second grade teacher, Mrs. Levy, asked her pupils a simple question. Where do your ancestors come from? The exercise was meant to highlight the wonderful fusion of cultures that Australia is supposed to represent. Mrs. Levy had planned to have the children color the flags of the countries that their families had come from and then hang them around the classroom. It was a testament to inclusion and multiculturalism in which Mrs. Levy strongly believed. Yet, all of that had ended when Sarah declared enthusiastically, I am from Palestine. Sarah did not know that Mrs. Levy was Jewish. Even if she had known, she would not have cared or have been, or have even understood the layered meanings of that identity in relation to Sarah's as a Palestinian Arab and Mrs. Levy, according to some, as her political or cultural antithesis. 
Until that moment, grade two had been quite uneventful. Sarah had focused hard on school. She was always happy there, away from her stressful home life. Sarah's English were constantly improving, and aside from her father's violent temper, things were quite, go, quite going quite well for her. But then Mrs. Levy said, there is no such thing as Palestine. And immediately moved on to another student, ignoring Sarah's bewildered expression. Something inside the little girl forever changed. It could not be that Iyad had been lying to her all of her life, and that her mother and even Uncle George were part of a conspiracy to convince her that she was something she was not, and for what purpose? Palestine was a fact. She relived the memories of her visit. She had been there. She had smelled the fruit trees and tasted the dried thyme and olive oil and had dipped her falafel into her homemade hummus. She had seen the villages and the welcoming children who spend their entire summer vacations <coughs> plotting ways to acquire candy and the kind village elders whose kisses lift traces of a unique and ancient scent. Palestinian Jesus may have looked tortured and dazed as portrayed in Bejal as many churches, but he was kind. And he said gentle things about the poor, and he called on those who went astray to return to God's kingdom. Between the rock of the Israeli occupation and the Hasbara, and the hard place of Palestinian leadership, failure, and acquiesce, Palestine, her people, and her story have been trapped and misconstrued. But now that the elitist discourse has failed, it is time for Palestinian intellectuals to step up. It is incumbent upon us, not just as Palestinians, but also as those who want to see a truthful understanding of the historic struggle and resistance of the Palestinian people to reclaim the Palestinian narrative and to dislocate the propaganda-driven Zionist one. We must retell the story while focusing wholly on the lives, perspectives, and representation of ordinary people, refugees, poor, underclass, and working-class Palestinians. A long time ago, Layla's grandparents had built a house in Syria. It resembled their earlier home as closely as possible. Perhaps this replica of their place in Palestine was meant to heal old hidden wounds. Their little haven, sprinkled with happy memories, under the orange trees and a fountain of stone and marble in the center of their small orchard allowed them to travel in dreams to the homes they longed for. During the war, they had abandoned this new, ha this new house too and escaped to Jordan where they became refugees once more. Where will they return when the war is over? To Syria? To Lebanon? Or will they stay in Jordan? But why not Palestine? Why never Palestine? Though Layla had never been there, the rusty key in their family home was clearly marked. The key to our home in Palestine. We will die here here in the last passage, here and here. Our blood will plant its olive tree. Thank you.